The road to Galbrick was not long. At a steady pace, the small village could be reached by sundown, but for some reason Sir Caledon did not seem to be in any hurry to get there. We departed late in the morning and traveled at a very leisurely pace. Naturally, by now, I knew him better than most, so I could tell that he clearly intended not to arrive this evening. For what reason, I did not know at the time, but I made my own assumptions. Unlike the Knights of the Patrol, I had not been briefed about the mission before we'd left Venturum. I had no idea what strange happenings had been reported. I assumed it was another bandit problem, and I had it in my head that this was Sir Caledon's reason for trotting along so leisurely. Trade routes throughout Athala were occasionally beset by rogue bandits extorting tolls or tributes or whatever else they decided to call their extortion. Regular patrols along these routes helped to discourage such villainy, but it still happened from time to time. Word of it would eventually reach the nearest garrison and a patrol would be sent out to deal with it. Sometimes the mere show of force was enough to scare the bandits off and the patrol didn't have to do anything. A dozen knights thundering down the road, sunlight gleaming from their polished armor, and the Athlon pennant waving in the breeze can be quite an intimidating sight for a typical band of brigands hoping to score some easy money from unarmed traders' caravans. Outright battle with such bands was fairly rare. Most were wise enough to either run at the sight of armored knights or surrender and beg mercy from the crown. The foolish ones didn't fare quite so well. Thus, I assumed this was Sir Caledon's intent. A slow, steady trot up the road might be enough to scatter the bandits and avoid a messy fight. But by the time the sun began to wane, I had not seen or heard any sign of bandits. I became puzzled when we stopped. His orders were clear, but seemed quite unusual. We were to set up camp back into the woods away from the road. He wanted guards posted, ordered no fires to be lit, and insisted that any noise be kept to a minimum. Clearly, he did not want our presence to be noticed. This was a clear sign that my assumption was wrong. We had not come here to scare off common brigands. When the light of the sun had faded, I felt a strange hush fall upon the forest. The usual sounds of the forest were still there, but to me they seemed quieter than usual, as if the forest itself was trying to stay hidden as well. Perhaps it was just my fanciful imagination, but something here didn't seem quite right. However, I seemed to be the only one to notice it. Sometime in the middle of the second watch, we bolted out of our restless slumber at a sound in the distance. While there were no more unusual sounds, the rest of the night passed uneasily for all of us. In the morning, we rode down to the village. Many of the villagers seemed almost relieved to see us, and Sir Caledon wasted no time seeking out the local mayor. We set ourselves up in the only barn large enough to accommodate all of our horses, and the knights began to spread out through the village talking to various peasants. By midday, everyone had returned to the barn, and Sir Caledon held a sort of informal meeting. This is when I finally discovered what was happening and why we were sent here. There had been a few unexplained gruesome deaths lately. People literally torn apart. Last night, it was Widow Featherstone. That must have been the scream we'd heard. She'd been found on the floor of her bedchamber with her stomach ripped open and entrails littered across the floor. All signs pointed toward an animal attack except the tracks. Sir Caledon had seen them himself. The tracks clearly looked like a very large wolf, but there were only two. Whatever it was, walked upright like a man. Apparently, this was enough information for the knights. All at once, they began to talk over one another in nervous tones. I only caught bits and pieces of their words, but it was clear that they were worried. I dare say even scared. Until now, I'd never even imagined knights could be scared. Worried, yes. Cautious even, but scared? Of course, I understand now, but I did not then. Enough! Sir Caledon's voice boomed out like thunder, silencing them all immediately. We are knights of Athala, he lectured, and we will do what we must do. But sir, we have nothing to fight it with. I could not tell who'd said it, but the rest mumbled their agreement. I had no idea what he meant. They were all well armed. I do, Sir Cowden answered calmly. The rest of you only need to herd it toward me. Clearly they did not approve of the idea, but Sir Cowden issued his orders to each and they departed to carry them out. The other knights gone, I watched as he paced nervously back and forth across the barn in thought for a while. 
Throughout the day, nights came and went reporting to him one thing or another, and at sundown he simply told me and the other squires to stay with the horses tonight. He instructed us to bar the barn doors after he left and to keep them that way no matter what happened. It was a restless evening for me. Obviously something was going to happen and I had no idea when or what. Patience, I chuckled to myself. Apparently I was getting another lesson in it tonight, whether I wanted to or not. A few hours later, the horses began to get restless. They were nervously pawing the floor and rustling about within the barn, nostrils flaring as they tossed their manes. They could smell something in the air and it frightened them. We did our best to keep them calm, but it was impossible after we heard the first loud thump on the barn doors. The horses reared and kicked wildly when we heard the second thump, and three of the four squires with me went down from the force of their hooves. There was no time to check on them as a third loud crash splintered the board holding the door shut. They came flying open as a giant hulking mass of fur sprang into the barn and ripped right into the nearest horse. The rest of the horses immediately sprang to the other side of the barn only to find their escape from the beast blocked. Confused and scared, they ran toward the only exit they could and another fell under the beast's claws as the herd stampeded out into the night running full speed away from this thing. With no way out except through it, Bartholomew and I stood staring in shock at this thing as it sank its sharp teeth into the horse and ripped flesh off its neck. Its head swiveled back and forth, scanning the immediate area as it chewed on the horse flesh in its mouth, and it froze mid-chew when it eyed the two of us standing there like great frozen idiots. In a flash, it sprang from the horse toward us. Bart and I dove in opposite directions trying to avoid the thing. I hit the floor, rolled upright, and looked back just in time to see the beast's jaws clamp shut on Bart's skull. I will never forget that sickening sound. A crunch followed by a squish as blood sprayed outward like water from a pop balloon. I could still see Bart's blood dripping from its jaws as it turned toward me. Instinctively, I took two steps backward but came up against the barn wall. I could not retreat anymore. For years afterward, I chided myself for a fanciful imagination. Beasts like this run on instinct and are beyond humor, so it's impossible for this thing to have found my circumstances funny, but I could not shake the belief that this thing smiled when it saw I was now trapped. It did not pounce as it had on Bart a moment ago, but took two slow paces in my direction. When our eyes finally met, time seemed to stand still. It was no longer a beast I was staring at, it was just two small circles of pure darkness. As strange as it may sound, it was, well, peaceful. I don't know how long that moment lasted, but I was snapped back into reality by a sickening howl. With one hand, the beast flung Sir Cowan into the other side of the barn and plucked the dagger out of its chest with the other, letting it fall to the floor as it turned to follow the day's night. Just then, the other knights came rushing through the open door, screaming and waving swords about, making a hell of a racket. Obviously a distraction, as the knights did not try to advance on the beast, but fanned out in a semicircle around it, shouting and swinging their swords wildly. The last one through the door assisted my stricken mentor to his feet, and after a quick word, they both stared helplessly at the dagger now lying on the floor behind the beast. The beast advanced on Sir Isaac first, and while his sword hit with a loud thump, there was no wound where there should have been, and the beast's sharp claws tore a deep gash across his midsection where the armor didn't quite protect him. Instantly, I understood. This dagger at my feet was the only weapon in the room that could hurt this thing. As the other knights kept the thing busy, I picked up the dagger and waited for my moment. When it was finally facing away, I leapt onto its back and drove the dagger down into its skull, just like I'd done with the boar all those months ago in the forest. With one final howl of fury, the beast fell limp to the floor, and I stared in horror as the body began to change. It began to shrink and contort. The fur receded, and then when it was all over, I found myself staring down at the lifeless body of the mayor with a dagger in his skull. A werewolf, I was told later. Lycanthropy isn't unheard of in Etia, but it isn't so commonplace that everyone carries silver weapons either. It was just luck that the dagger Sir Caledon always carried was. In the morning, we bought a wagon from one of the farmers to carry Bart and Sir Isaac's bodies back to Venturum and prepared to leave Galbraith. The villagers cheered for Sir Caledon and the knights, and I admit, I was not just slightly angered by it. 
I had killed the beast, not them. But with every cheer, every thank you, and every handshake they received, I noticed subtle glances in my direction, especially from my mentor. They all knew the truth and could have corrected the villagers at any time. Instead, they were using the villagers' ignorance to judge my reaction to the personal slight. A knight doesn't crave glory and puts the reputation of the unit ahead of personal accolades. The villagers may not know that I had killed their beast, but they knew that we had, and that was enough. To speak up now would show the others that I craved personal glory, and any respect I had gained last night would be wiped away. I held my tongue. I even joined in applauding the knights for their heroic deed as we rode out of the village. The general atmosphere of our return trip was something of a contradiction. On the one hand, we were all saddened by the loss of Bart and Sir Isaac, and their covered bodies on the wagon rumbling at the rear of the column was a constant reminder that our victory in Galbrick had come at a price. But we were victorious. We had accomplished what we'd been sent to do, and there was a small amount of pride in all of us for that. For my part, I felt as though every eye was upon me, and this scrutiny was a little uncomfortable for a while. At various points during the morning when our eyes happened to cross paths, I received short nods from some of the knights, and I swear I even saw a little bit of pride in Sir Caledon. By high sun, the pressure I felt, whether real or imagined, seemed to finally let up. It appeared I had passed their test, and suddenly the lost praise of a few villagers seemed quite insignificant next to the respect I had gained from these men.